guys you're welcome back hope you guys are doing great so guys we're gonna be checking out this video titled seven verses from the Quran shocked and made me convert to Islam and this was from professor Jeffrey Lang so let's watch guys I looked at that question and said that's my question why would you create this violent and pernicious creature when you could create angels Hmm. You can't just get off that easy. You can't just tell me you know exactly what you're doing. Not after what I've been through. And it began like this. It said, Behold, your Lord said to the angels, I am going to place a vicegerent on earth. The Arabic word is khalifa. It means a representative or an emissary of hmm. mine. I am going to place a vicegerent on earth. And they said, the angels said, Will you place therein one who will spread corruption and shed blood? while we celebrate your praises and glorify your holiness? Mm. And God said, he said, truly I know what you do not know. Mm. See, that's the verse that hooked me. That's the verse that caught my attention. That's the one that kept on making me read the story again and again oh, and again. Wow. Because listen to the way it begins. Behold, your Lord said to the angels, I'm going to place a representative of mine on earth, a vicegerent of mine, an emissary, one who acts on my behalf. I thought, that, that's not the way it goes. Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to be placing man on the earth in some positive role, some elective office. You place man as a, on earth as a punishment for his sin. Clearly, I knew the author didn't quite get the point. But still, it was an amazing line. But then I come to the next line, and it says, and the angels say, will you place her in one who will spread corruption and shed blood? Will we celebrate your praises and glorify you? I looked at it again. I couldn't believe the question. They said, will you place her in one who will spread corruption and shed blood while we, the angels, celebrate your praises and glorify you? I looked at that and I said, exactly. That would be my question. Why would you create this being, supposedly for some positive role, when he's capable of doing tremendous wrongdoing? when he could spread corruption and shed much blood. Why would you create this violent and pernicious creature when you could create angels? As the angels clearly say, while we, while we the angels, celebrate your praises and glorify you. They're asking one of the most fundamental questions in the entire history of religion. Why create you, man, this utterly fallible creature this creature who could rebel against God's will, who could do such tremendous wrongdoing, who could wreak havoc like no other creature on earth, when you can make him angels. Mm. And look where the question is being asked. It's being asked in heaven. It's almost like saying, look, why don't you just make him angels and be up here in heaven with us, you know? Why don't you just make him angels, pop him into heaven, he's fine. Why would you put him on earth where he could feel distant from you, where he could work out his worse criminal tendencies, act them out, feeling somehow independent and apart from you and free to do whatever he wants, when you could just make them angels and put them in heaven and make them perfectly submissive mm. to your will. Mm. I looked at that question and said, that's my question. I'm, not, I'm one, not even a single verse into the story of mankind and there before me I see my question. That whole question, everything that I ever thought, everything that I ever experienced, everything that I ever knew was in that question. It was as if the author took my life and wanted to pick out exactly the right question to humiliate me, to provoke me, to anger me. Why create man, this most destructive and violent creature, when you can make him angels? And then look at the answer. And he said, God said, Truly I know what you do not know. You know, in modern parlance, we would say, I know exactly what I'm doing. I read that and said, what? You know what you do not know? You know exactly what you're doing? Well, please inform me. Tell me what you're doing. Because, you know, I'm, I'm 28 years old, and I haven't figured out it yet. And I have a lot of issues that I'm still dealing with that's connected to this question. You can't just get off that easy. You can't just tell me you know exactly what you're doing. Not after what I've been through. Not after you made me this way. 
And then I realized, of course, I was arguing with a God I didn't even believe in. And that would happen several times as I read through the Quran. And sometimes I would just get into such, so, I'm so agitated by what I read, I'd start arguing with this voice that's, that's, that I'm reading before me, that's calling to me. So we turn to the next verse. Well, it turns out that the Quran just doesn't dismiss the question. It starts to answer it a little bit. And in the next verse it says, And he taught Adam, God taught Adam, the names of all things. And then he placed them before the angels and said, Tell me their names if you are right. So this verse is clearly referring to the previous one. But notice what it says. Now, I, I, from my own background, I remember Adam naming things. But it wasn't connected to any answer to any philosophical question. But here, notice what it says. And he taught Adam the names of all things. And I realized already, just from the first verse, you've got to read these verses very carefully because it's packed with a lot of symbolism and meaning. And he taught Adam the names of all things. So here we see Adam is not only just a creature who knows how to name things, who's acquiring the gift of language, but he's also a learning creature. God is teaching him. Now, right here, right in this verse, and it'll come even clearer in the subsequent verses, that the very first thing that the, that the Quran is going to emphasize here is man's intellect. He is a learning creature. He is taught. And what is he taught? What is, the, what is one of the great intellectual gifts he's given in response to the angel's question? The gift of language. Because through language, mankind could not only learn, but he could learn things not only through his own experience, but he could learn things that other people have experienced of times and places that are hundreds, thousands of years and miles separated from him. And so that all our knowledge becomes cumulative. Every generation learning from the generation before it. I'm learning today from authors I read from other sides of the world that may have existed 2,000 years ago. And so we all contribute to our collective learning and knowledge. And so what I'll see later in the Quran, when the Quran will emphasize this again and again and again, like in one verse it says, read in the name of your Lord who created. Amen. Created a man out of a tiny creature that clings. Read, it commands the reader. For your Lord is most bountiful. Why is he most bountiful? What great gift did he give you? For he taught man the use of the pen. And through it taught him what he otherwise could not hmm. know. And time and time and time again, the Quran will call upon man to use his intellectual faculties and swear by his intellectual faculties and to, and to use them correctly as a, as, as, because they play a fundamental role in guiding him to truth. I never came upon a scripture that puts so much emphasis on the correct use of our intellectual faculties, on the harnessing of reason in helping us attain to faith. And he taught Adam the names of all things. And then he placed them before the angels and said, tell me their names if you are right. Mm. Okay, you have this objection to, you have this natural question about this creation of mankind. Here, this mankind is a, this is a human being, this human creature is a learning creature. He has many intellectual gifts. Here, I'm going to place these things before you. Tell me their names if you are right about mm. man. And what did the angels say? In the next verse they say, Glory to you. We have no knowledge except what you have taught us. In truth, it is you who are knowing, the wise. They say this, be, this task, this intellectual test that's put before them is beyond their grasp. Notice what they emphasize. We have no knowledge. This would take knowledge. This would take an intellect that they don't possess. In truth, it is you who are knowing the wise. You got it. It's easy for you. You have you're the knowing the wise. You have knowledge. You have wisdom. But this would take knowledge and wisdom that is beyond us. And so in the next verse we read, and he said, Oh, Adam, tell them, tell them their names. And when he had told them their names, notice how it's just like it's nothing for him. For mankind, he has this phenomenal ability. And when he had told them their names, as if it's just a triviality for man, he names them. Oh, Adam, tell them their names. And when he had told them their names, God said, did I not tell you that I know what is unseen in the heavens and the earth? And I know what you reveal and conceal? And he's clearly going back to the angel's question. Yes, you have these natural concerns about the creation of mankind. 
Yes, he could do these evil things. But look at this tremendous intellect he has. This is something you have overlooked that you haven't considered. And that's clearly the point of these verses. Even though I, under, I felt that the author didn't quite, uh, you know, he, it was as if I, I realized that he didn't, not, just didn't misunderstand the story. He was taking one of the great stories in the history of humankind, one of the fundamental greatest stories in the history of mankind, and molding it and using it as a vehicle for an entirely original message. <clears throat> and God said, did I not tell you that I know what is unseen in the heavens and the earth? And I know what you reveal and what you conceal. In other words, didn't I tell you I know exactly what I'm doing? And then in the next, and didn't I not tell you what I, that I know what you reveal and conceal? I looked at that. What question did their, I mean, what did they reveal and what did they conceal? What did their question reveal and conceal? I thought about it for a minute. Oh, it's obvious. What did their question reveal? Just go back and look at the question. It revealed the sinful and sinister propensities of man. I mean, it's obvious, right? Mm. Why are you all looking at me like that? <laughs> You're starting to scare me. You're all looking very serious. Am I losing you? <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. So they revealed the sinister and evil propensities of man. But what did their question conceal? And all you have to do is think about it for a minute. Human beings, yes, they could do evil. Yes, they could do wrong. Yes, they could create misery. But they could also do exactly the opposite. They could choose to do evil. They could choose to do tremendous good. They could choose to do tremendous violence. They could choose to show tremendous compassion. They could choose to, be, you know, to live by falsehood. They could choose to live by the greatest truths. They could be terribly ugly. They could be terribly beautiful. And I, up until that point in my life, I, like the angels, had only saw one half of one side of the coin. Mm. For the first time when I read that verse, believe it or not, it was an eye-opener mm. for me. I had always been <laughs> obsessed with the evil potentials of human beings. When I read that verse, I realized that, and I had a great example right in front of me with my own mom, mm. I realized that I had been blinded by only one side of human nature. So we go on to the next verse. And behold, we said to the angels, bow down to Adam. Before leaving, make sure to subscribe, share your comments. That was kind of powerful and a bit scary, guys. And that verse, that particular verse actually got to me because that angel actually asks a very, very good question. Why, do, why is it that? There are people that do evil. The angel was like, why can't God create people like an angel? Why is that there are still people that does evil? Like God created mankind, you know, in his own image. So it's not left for the mankind to choose his own path, what you want to do. And what always baffles people is that how do people feel comfortable to do evil? Like sometimes you people will be wondering that does God not see this kind of things happening? But nobody can question God because <laughs> like the man said that in the other verse, the communication he had with Abraham, God had with Abraham, and God was like, You can say that I am I can see everything. Everything that mankind does, I see it. I see it, I know it. Even before you take a step, I already know what you are about to do. But that doesn't mean I'm not paying attention. Like, that angel actually asks a good question. And that verse kind of scares me because the fact that it's still happening and it will still happen. We have different type of people. We have the good, the bad. You know, we have different set of people in this world. But that doesn't mean we cannot survive. What we should try and do is to make sure that we are careful with the kind of people we associate with. We are careful, you know, 
we are careful with with the places we go to we are careful with everything we do on daily basis and daily basis and even though we are careful it's not enough we need to be prayerful you need to hold on to god because see we, we are getting to the last days we are in the last days evil we keep coming one way or the other things bad things will keep happening but that shouldn't make you lose focus on God. You should put your eyes, your focus on God. No matter what is going on around you, don't lose hope. That verse, the way the man was saying it and he was about to tear up, like, it shook me. I was like, what? There's a particular verse like that in the Quran. That's mighty. Wow. All is well. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Don't forget to smash that subscribe button for more. Like, share, and comment. I'll see you in the next one.